Over a 35 year period, we stole something like 2.7 million between us. Um, Jeez. Didn't last very long either. The most we ever took in one go was 160,000, and that was between three of us. Good to meet you. What's your name? Corne. No. No, nice to meet you, though. Nice to meet you as well. How you doing? Good. Different, boy. A bit different to what I was expecting. Yeah. Yeah, a bit. What were you expecting? I don't know. You know, you still got like something about you. Crusty looking old geezer. <laughs> I wouldn't read this without my glasses. <laughs> what did you get sentenced for? I had the cutting agent for cocaine. It's a legit thing, you know what I mean? It's legit, but it's just how you use it. So they said, oh, this guy, he's got 50 kilos of this shit, and he's obviously doing it with cocaine. What else is he gonna do it with yeah. me? And it was, it was just my birthday. I, get, get, like, I, I don't do drugs, but I got given everything. I had cocaine on me, I had MD on me, I had cannabis on me, I had a knife on me, I had, I had about 32 bottles of alcohol in the boot. So they hit me at the right time, you know? I think in total I got about five years, eight months. What about you? You got a life sentence, right? Yeah, I got life for um, armed robbery, possession of firearms and ammunition, uh, conspiracy to rob and possession of explosives. No, not um, then. I had like a sentence in my head that if I got that year or two or whatever, that would make it worth it, but I got way more than that. Been out now for about nine months. No, no, what about you? How long have you been out? I've been out uh, nine years last week. Nine years? Yeah, yeah. What was the most you ever made from crime? To me, a lot. Maybe not to other people, but to me, a lot. I could have had about a grand come in a day, but because they're in tens and twenties, and I'm buying food, and I'm buying weed, and I'm buying clothes, I don't really know. Like, I don't. I, I could have hired three accountants, and they probably still don't know what my in and my outs were. Do you know what I mean? Because you just you just splash it as you go. What about you? How much money do you think you? Oh, way more than me, than banks, but. Over a 35 year period, we stole something like 2.7 million between us. Um, Jeez. Didn't last very long either. The most we ever took in one go was 160,000, and that was between three of us. I actually had mine in a Tesco's carrier bag under the bed. Within about six weeks, the bag was empty, and that was it. We were out bang at it again. You went for 50 grand in six weeks? Yeah. You want to spend it fast because if you get nicked with it, and the police get it back, it's pointless, you have done it, you know what I mean? So we used to get rid of money quick, nick your money, spend your money, want more, eventually get caught, go to prison for many years, come out, and what are you good for? You're good for doing what you've done before you went to prison, because prison teaches you nothing. And that's why we could never get out of the game. Money comes and goes. Money comes and goes, yeah, it's true. Did you ever carry a weapon? When I became an armed robber, it, be, it was tools of your trade. You know, you had to carry something in order to, to intimidate and frighten people to give you their money. Every time I went out of my house, I had to check that I had at least one weapon with me. One was normally a gun. I used to carry a knife as well as a gun. Sometimes I would carry two guns, a knife and a stun gun. The only thing I've never really carried on the streets, and my mate offered me one time, was a box of grenades for 20 pound each. 20 pound? Yeah, this was back in the 70s, when you could, you could get stuff like that nicked off army camps. I wouldn't carry a grenade because it's indiscriminate, but I always had, had to have something to protect myself and protect my family. And mainly, I've got to say, it was from the police. Did you carry weapons? I carried a weapon, just a knife. I say just a knife, it's not just a knife, it's bad, but just a knife, like, just always on the waist. Did you ever use the knife? Yeah, of course. Of course. It's not a toy. A lot? No, not a lot, not a lot. I always had a mentality which other people don't share. Like, if I don't like that one person, it's just that one person. Nowadays, I think people are like, cool. If I don't like A and A rolls B and C, then I'll get all of them. And I'm not like that. I'm like, only this person's done me wrong. I'm not one of these people that will stab someone over a girl. It must have been late 2014. Lewisham had the worst stabbing rate in the whole of the boroughs. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's, it's, it's got worse? I think everyone has to take a bit of the blame. I think police service for a lack of numbers. I think even parents for the way they parent people. Social media for what they condemn and what they allow. Councils, 
like there's no youth clubs. I don't see any youth clubs. I don't know if you do. Yeah, budget cuts. I couldn't be an MP or nothing because I would just blame so many people. I think at the moment everyone's so worried about the EU. They're not really worried about 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 youth. People getting stabbed left, right, and centre. Describe the moment you knew there was no turning back on crime. For me, it was every time I went in to rob somewhere. You know, I, I kind of felt the fear, but I couldn't, it was never a turning point. It was never a stop. Your gun's already half out, your mask's already half down. As you walk across the pavement and put your hand on the door of the premises, you're gonna rob, because by then, you've committed yourself. What was the moment you knew when there was no turning back? No, when you start, you just sit there, you regret something. That's when I knew there was no turning back. I know that would probably deter some people, but with me, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm far too gone now. Like, but I probably went from selling two packs a day to 10 packs a day. I was always smart enough to know what I was doing was wrong, but I just never allowed myself to get to that stage to kind of reconcile that, to fix it. And once I see money, I couldn't stop. I was more into the adrenaline rush, the danger, you know what I mean? The, the, absolute feeling of being alive when you walk across that pavement. I was an insignificant kid, you know what I mean? I used to get bullied and beaten up by all the other gangs and that. So when I became in charge, when I had a gun in my hand or a weapon in my hand, I was 10 foot tall. After you're over that initial fear, that initial like, shit, that's gonna be bad, it's, it's all up, it's all like, you're ready, you know what I mean? It's all positive, it's all happy, you love what you're doing, and you, you must see it. it. Things deteriorate quickly. Like, oh, yeah. from one bank to two banks to four banks. And it comes an addiction. Same as violence. Violence can be an addiction as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adrenaline like rush. People, yeah. Um, desc <laughs> Sorry. Describe prison food in two words. Absolute shite. <laughs> Describe the contraband that was being sold. Right, mate. <laughs> Have we got an hour? <laughs> uh, you can buy anything in prison. If you've got the money, you can buy anything. Knives, um, Dartmoor was favourite for that. And a workshop made prison beds. So you can imagine the knives that come out of Dartmoor workshop. You're talking about sabres and everything and daggers. The only thing you can't buy is a woman. Mm. Not in British shells. Mm. Fault. Of course you can, because they used to have the prostitutes come in from the outside. Yes, you're right. I think the worst thing you can buy in prison, in the top security prisons, is you can buy someone's life. And you can get someone killed for a quarter of an ounce of uh, heroin, I think, was the main price. Was that, that like £200 on the road, if that? Yeah. What things did you do to keep sane in prison? To keep sane, the visits. My mum, every month, every single month, she was there, niece and nephews, my sisters. Those, that's the only thing you look forward to. You must agree, that's a visit, so that's the only thing you really look forward to in prison, like. I was, I was different, I refused visits. I wouldn't let people come in from the outside because I didn't want the outside world intruding onto prison because I think you can't live with one foot in prison and one foot outside. And because my sentences were very, very long, um, I kind of like, visits weren't for me. So my, my way of keeping the same was causing them as much trouble as I could, yeah. all the way through my prison system. Any way I could do it, I would do it. I'd make hooch, I would sell weapons, I would sell drugs, I would assault screws, I would set up riots, I would attack sex offenders. So I decided to myself, listen, if you want a criminal, I'm gonna give you a fucking criminal. It was just mental, but it kept me going all the time and it kept my brain ticking over until I discovered education. And once I discovered education, that became my drug and that kept me sane. So me and education, we just, we never clicked. Right. Yeah, we never, never really liked each other, me and education, so. Bunk school all the time. I was just probably scared to be like, if I don't get the result I want, I'm gonna look stupid, so I might as well just be the class clown. From there, that's where it all kind of started, probably. Like, I got kicked out two weeks from my GCSEs, had like nine months out of school. Literally yeah. just lawyer until next opportunity arises. But everyone has done, probably done bad or wants to be bad in their life, goes for a little stage, a little window, maybe 13 or 15, where it's cool to be arrested. Have blue cars around you, you look almost famous. I think if you don't educate yourself, then you can't understand the concept of rehabilitation. That's why so many people in jail, yeah. it's like a revolving door to them because they don't learn anything. Yeah, they yeah, don't yeah. apply themselves. They just want to lay on the bed and watch the telly or take drugs. Since going to prison and stuff, I've done open university and all this stuff and I'm learning a language now, but. But you said you've been doing education since. Do you enjoy it now? No, I don't enjoy <laughs> it. No, 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 I don't enjoy it. I just, um, I just do it. Um, what do you do now? So in, in prison I learnt my craft as coffee. 
I'm a barista, I'm a road star, I do a bit of work, do a bit of fixing machines and stuff like that. So um, now I work for a homeless charity. Right. Um, who we hire homeless people through coffee, we pay them on a living wage and all that stuff. And um, hopefully soon, sooner rather than later, I'm going to be teaching them how to uh, how to make coffee. And I also, I also work with um, kids with challenging behaviour. So probably kids that were like me, yeah. about eight years ago or whatever. You must do something you're proud of. Uh, yeah, when I was in jail, I wrote some books. Nice. And become a pretty uh, talented writer. And when I got out, I joined Inside Time, which is the National Prisoners newspaper. I've seen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm the um, um, commissioning editor. I do a lot of talks and criminology tours and I go into schools and young offenders places and speak to them um, and try and let them know that what they see, what they think their impression of prison is, as you well know, is not what it really is. And basically try and put people off. If you can stop one person from going down the line that we went down, mm -hmm. then I think that is a job well done and it's worth it. And I think what you're doing now is a good thing. Sort of, man. Thanks so much, man. Nice one.